always trying to keep vigilant for some truth that somebody may speak in regards to the scripture or some insight that will uh, help me to understand better the word of God and also at the same time of course to ferret out any false doctrine that I hear and the deception of this world because that is plentiful too but last week as Brett was speaking from Romans chapter 9 about the Apostle Paul willing to become a curse for his people if it would lead to their salvation it reminded me of a connection here as Paul writes of his inner thoughts but as Brett mentioned there no one can do such a thing as what Paul wanted to do no one can be saved for someone else even if that person is willing to take the punishment of another he cannot affect the salvation of someone else Paul's desire was so strong for the salvation of his fellow Jews that there was always in the back of his heart and the back of his mind this lingering sorrow which never went away he knew that it was out of his hands to do anything to affect the salvation of his fellow countrymen if they would not obey Paul was willing to give up his life he was willing to be a curse from God so that others could be saved he was willing to suffer the wrath of God and to take the place of others who deserve the same to give his individual life for the redemption of a whole nation if that's what it took if he could but he couldn't however however there is one who can and has done all those things and more one who was in sorrow one who had the desire for the repentance of the whole nation as well as individually one who became a curse not only for them but for the whole world one who worked so that others could be saved through his righteous work and he is able to save unlike mere mortal man Isaiah 53 tells us that Christ was a man of sorrows and afflicted with grief and why was he in sorrow it was because of our sin wasn't it sin causes sorrow and eventually death to counter this we see in John chapter 10 verse 10 that Jesus said I am come that they speaking of the world might have life and that they might have it more abundantly he was even willing to lay down his life and to become a curse for the sake of others the innocent standing in for the guilty how did he do that well Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 23 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 tell us that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree of course this is Christ taking the wrath of God that should have been rightfully ours because of this love he took the divine anger of God upon himself that would have forever destroyed us had we been the recipients of it in John chapter 11 verses 48 through 52 there is a prophecy from a very unlikely source and it just goes to show that under the Old Testament law that the Holy Spirit of God moved men certain men to say or to do certain things to carry out the will of God even if that man was not necessarily a God fearing person John chapter 11 verses 48 through 52 read like this and this is John speaking of the Sanhedrin council as they gather together he says if we let this man alone all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation and one of them named Caiaphas being the high priest that year said of them you know nothing at all nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not and this he spake not of himself but being high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only but that he should also gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad what Paul could not do even though he wished to Jesus can do and did do and is still doing to this day he takes away the darkness and the sin and in place gives light and life he takes away the anger of God and places us instead in the family of God 
where we become his sons and his daughters, the children of God. And he redeems us, instilling within us eternal life, which is the earnest of the Holy Spirit of God. And all these things, and so much more that I haven't mentioned, are all exemplified in this supper that we come each Lord's Day to remember this sacrifice and this one who took for himself upon himself those things which should have rightly been ours. Shall we pray? Our most gracious, kind Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the love that you've shown us all, Father. The love of your Son, Father, who sent him to us, Father, to be that sacrifice for us, Father, on our cross. Father, as we gather around this table this morning, Father, we ask, Father, that you bless each and every one of us here, Father, at this table. And God, we ask you to bless this loaf, Father, which is, Father, this blood, the broken body. Mm -hmm. Father, we know without the death, the burial, and the resurrection, we would not have hope. And God, we're truly thankful for the hope that we do have in your Son, Jesus. God, we just pray that everything we do and say here this morning is good and pleasing you, Father. Go with us, watch over us, and guide us. And most of all, Father, please forgive us when we do fail. For it's in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, we do thank you <coughs> once again for your ability to be back in your house this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come to this fellowship and to hear your word and learn more from your word each time we come here to hear your word. And we do pray that through your word, you might continue to be known here. We thank you now for this time that we have to come around the table this morning. Pray that you'll be with us as we partake of this cup, this bread that shed upon this God's heart. For as often as we do, we take it here, seeing these words here this morning. Most of all, we thank you for the one who died upon the cross to be filled with our sorrow. We just pray that you'll be with us now as we partake and go with us through the service this morning and throughout the day. Just help us to always live and walk close to you every day, each day. We pray especially now as we be with those that couldn't make it out this morning and cannot see. Go with us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
at this time, we'll give everyone an opportunity to give back to the Lord a small portion of that which he has so richly blessed us with. I'd like to ask Ken if he would to lead us in prayer for the offering, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day to tell you we want to thank you for the help and the strength and the freedom that we have to wash our house together on our table and come to this thing for what it is. Thank you. Bless this offering, Heavenly Father. We have not received. Let us give back just a portion of what you have richly preserved us, Heavenly Father. Go with us through the remainder of the service. Lead us over on a prayer list. Thank you being with those that's going to have surgery this week, Heavenly Father. If you're able, stand with us and let's sing, I'm blessed. If you're happy to be here today, say amen. If you're happy to be a Christian, say praise the Lord. He's good to us, isn't he? Uh, he loves us. He takes care of us. And he uh, adds to us, which is what happened Wednesday night. Kelly, uh, I'll just give this to you later to save you up here. Kelly is now with us here at Sims Hill Christian Church. If you didn't get a chance to hug her neck Wednesday night, then make sure you do it tonight and make her feel welcome. We're glad that she is here. Uh, uh, family of Pates that are here today, we're glad that you're here too. It's good to see each and every one of you, though we are missing uh, quite a few still. We'll continue to keep them in our prayers if they make it back safely. Or should it be of sickness, uh, then they are healed quickly and back with us. If you have your Bibles, let's just get started this morning. I want you to go to Luke chapter 19. And hold that for this morning and tonight, Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> if you've been paying attention, the last few weeks of messages could all fall under a word called commitment. If you think about the messages the past few weeks, all of them are only possible if you are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ means you're committed to the church. You're committed to Him. So bottom line, following Jesus, and I hope everybody in here listens today, following Jesus means you have to have a deep level of commitment to him. Without commitment, there is no walk with Jesus Christ. You can fool yourself into believing you can be committed to everything and spend an hour in church Sunday and everything's going to be okay, but if you're not committed to him, first and foremost, there is no walk with Jesus. Don't care how good you feel about it in your heart. There's a lot of Christians, they've got a strong commitment to work. They've got a strong commitment to family. They've got a strong commitment to their spouse. They've got a strong commitment to being healthy 
and enjoying life and living it up. But unless your commitment to the Lord is stronger, then you're lost. All those things you're fine to be committed to, to family, to your spouse, to good health, to your work. Those are good things. Unless they take priority over the Lord Jesus Christ and His church. If they do, then you're lost. You have no walk with Jesus Christ. Because He's not first. You say, oh, Brent, now that's, You've just taken that a little bit too far. I believe if I remember right in Luke the 14th chapter, Jesus says if you don't hate your husband, your wife, your mama, your daddy, brothers, your sisters, if you don't hate all of these things, then you cannot follow me. Ain't that what Jesus said? Now we know in the Hebrew or in the Greek that that, that hate does not mean hate like we know it today. That means the order in which you choose things. If Jesus is at number one, then he's lashed. Anything more important in your life to you than Jesus Christ makes Jesus Christ dead last. And there is no walk with Him if you are not committed to Him first. Now y'all know as well as I do the level of commitment to anything will determine the strength of that relationship. If you're not committed to your wife or to your husband that's a weak relationship. If you're not committed to taking care of your mama, your daddy, when they get old, when they need you, that's a, that ain't much of a relationship there, is it? The level of commitment decides how strong a relationship truly is. You, you get out of something what you put into it. Now, what are you putting in for the Lord? Think about it. This is, this, this, you answer this. Nobody else can answer this for you. This is directed towards you. This sermon is directed towards me. What are you putting into your relationship, your commitment to the Lord? What are you putting into it? What comes first? What's more important than the church? Than your life to the Lord? Today we're going to uh, talk about a quick meeting here between Jesus and a man who was hated by his own people. A man who was looking for something different. Luke the 19th chapter of the first four verses and we'll finish this message up tonight. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho and behold there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief among the publicans. He was rich. He sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not because of the number of people. And he couldn't see Jesus because he was of little stature. He ran before and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see Jesus. For he was to pass this way. Now as we focus on this scripture this morning and tonight, we're going to gain some insight concerning one's commitment to the Lord. From this story, we're going to gain information we need when it comes to our commitment to Jesus Christ. But before commitment can happen, there has to be a transformation. Before you can be committed to the Lord, you've got to be transformed first. And before that commitment can grow, You've got to continue in that transformation process. You've got to be continuing to get be different and to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for transformation to begin, the first thing we see from this story is you've got to seek Jesus Christ. He's not just going to fall on you. He's not just going to what, what, uh, appear at your breakfast table one day. You have to seek him. And that's what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. 
He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to what? See. You remember that old song? Little in stature. Little feller. However, in all reality, this is a big dude. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of power. He extorted and took money from the Jewish people to give to the Roman government, and he always took more than what he was supposed to get. And the people hated him. But he still had power. They still feared him because he was a man of wealth. But yet, something was missing. Something was missing in his life. All this wealth, this power, did not fill this massive hole that was in this man's heart. He needed something more. Do you know anybody that's in that position? They got everything they seem they want or need, but something's missing. Are you here today in that position? You think you're floating along pretty good, life's pretty good, you got what you want, got what you need, more than everything's a clicking, but you feel empty? You say, well, as a matter of fact, no. I've got everything I need. I, come, I spend one hour a week with the Lord in church, and I, I, my life's great and wonderful. I don't feel no emptiness. Listen to me. There's coming a day you will. The devil makes everything great and wonderful for a short amount of time, and that may be decades sometimes. But there's coming a time you're going to feel the emptiness if you are without the Lord Jesus Christ and your life is not committed to him. Emptiness is coming. Darkness is coming. Gloom is coming. When you're not committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, the way you should be, the way you could be, Zacchaeus had wealth, but he wasn't happy. Jesus said in Mark 8, what, 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 do you, what, what do you profit? Should you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What's it done for you? You spend 50, 60, 70 years here living in health and wealth and joy and fun to spend eternity in hell? What's it been worth, Jesus said? What kind of profit is that? What are you willing to pay? What's the price you're willing to pay for your soul? Fame? Money? Prestige? Honor? A happy spouse? Is that worth your soul? What about an entertained family? Boy, you gotta, gotta work all day. And I work all day every day. You gotta do your chores. Saturday, Sunday, you gotta entertain the family. I've got to be entertained. I need me time. Boy, that's a liberal term. Goodness gracious, everybody needs their me time. Find that for me in the Bible. It's a godless term, me time. That's because you're focused on you. And you're focused on you because your commitment ain't to the Lord. You can have all of those things and still be missing something. Wealth and excitement. Zacchaeus was missing something. We see what that was. He ran to get ahead of the crowd so that he could see Jesus. A grown man literally running through the streets, climbing up in a tree just to see the Lord. Something gave him hope. Hope that Jesus could change his life and fill that which was empty. And that's what we have to do. Let me let, listen to me. Listen carefully. I'll be what, 54 on a month? 54. I've learned something in these adult years. If you're seeking true transformation and change, that doesn't come in a self-help book. It doesn't come in a 12-step program. It comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from his word in its entirety. That's where transformation and change and peace and joy and happiness and commitment come from. It ain't in a book outside the gospel of Jesus Christ. It cannot be found in anything else other than his word. Zacchaeus needed a transformation. 
Zacchaeus wanted to be a new creation. And Paul told the Corinth church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, therefore if anyone is in Christ, they're what? A new creation. Everything in the past is what? Done and gone away with and all things are new. Paul says those that are in Jesus Christ. You can write that down and look it up. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore anyone that is in Christ. So there's a question that we need an answer to. If I am a new creature in Christ, how do I get in Christ? Well, you can't believe into him. You can't pray into him. If you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and you're humble enough to repent of your sin, then you come and you're baptized, immersed into a body of water where you meet the blood of Jesus Christ that washes your sins away. And you rise up a new creature to walk in newness of life. That's what the whole chapter of Romans chapter 6 is about. Then we got Colossians, the second chapter, that says it's in baptism where God performs an operation where he cuts away the old man of sin. That puts you in Christ. Galatians 3.27 says that, John. That when we're baptized, we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Then we're delivered to God as his children, saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his plan of salvation. So many people in this world are looking for a new beginning. They're looking for something new, something to inspire them, something to make their life worth living, something to make them want to get up out of bed in the morning. They're looking for this, yet they walk in frustration. They walk in emptiness. And that's because they're seeking some transformation outside Jesus Christ, outside his word. And they're never going to be transformed. They're never going to be new. They're never going to be happy. They're never going to have joy. They're never going to be in peace. Oh, maybe for a little while with this fad or with that fad. But outside the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ in its entirety, there is no salvation. There is no transformation. There is no change. Transformation, like with Zacchaeus, begins seek by seeking Jesus first. And he can't seek Jesus without going to his word. For the word became flesh and dwelt amongst men, John says in John 1, 14. Jesus is that word. And that's where the church today fails. That's where our churches today are failing. In mainstream Christianity, the gospel has an easy flavor. It's easy to swallow. Oh, it kind of tastes good. Feels good. In mainstream Christianity today, the idea, you see, is to get as many people in their churches as they can. Whatever they got to do to bring them in, whatever they've got to throw away out of that Bible to bring them in, they want numbers to keep the, uh, and, and my, numbers are good. Large numbers of people are great, but not at the expense of the gospel. Not at the expense of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. We do not compromise that and remain the New Testament church. It is impossible to compromise this and remain saved and to remain a church that the Lord even recognizes as a church. But that's what mainstream uh, Christianity does today. But to keep the unconverted coming back, oh, the gospel's made smooth and easy to accept, easy to believe. And that opens the church up to all kinds of crazy practices and beliefs. You know, we had a preacher in a church here recently that uh, one of the people in the church died and the women decided it's time to take it over. Y'all remember that, don't you? The women were going to be the spiritual leaders of that. They'd, be the, they'd do the communion meditations. If they wanted to preach, they'd preach. If they wanted to baptize, they'd baptize. If they wanted to do this, they'd do. And you know what their excuse was? You say, well, Paul says it's a shame for a woman 
to speak with authority in the church, that they're to keep quiet. The apostle Paul says that, and you show them the scripture. You know what they say? That's 2,000 years old. Things have changed today. We go to some of our churches, and they, you walk by and get you, go to the bar out there and get you a coffee and a donut, pack of crackers if you need it. You sit there and you eat and you drink. But the apostle Paul says that's a shame. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? But that was 2,000 years ago, Brett. Things have changed. Have things changed? Answer the question. Have things changed from the way Jesus and the apostles preached it from today? Have they changed, yes or no? Then if they've changed in the churches, it is not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ anymore. You're lost. They're lost where there is no truth of God's word. But the truth is painful. The truth hurts. And it's not popular. That's the reason the true churches, for the vast majority, the true Christian churches today are about this size here or even smaller. Because to have the big ones, you've got to have the rock and roll band. You've got to have your donuts and coffee set up. Everybody gets to dance and twiggle a little bit while they dance and party and have a good time in the Lord's house. Being a disgrace to the Lord Jesus Christ that gave his life to build his church. It ain't yours. It ain't a preacher's. It ain't some godless teacher at some Bible college somewhere. It ain't some wonderful, experienced pastor, father, or doctor. It's the Lord's church. And it can't be committed to that if it's not teaching it right and preaching it right. We talked in Sunday school class, the gospel is received one of two ways, either with a cut heart and receiving it to bring about change or in a cut heart to cause anger, such in the, uh, in the story of Stephen. We go in most of our sister churches and open the Bible today, they'd be ready to stone us to death. Do you understand that? I don't care if it's got Christian church over the door. Unfortunately, sadly, that means nothing anymore. They'd rather stone you as to hear the truth. They'd rather stone you as to hear what Jesus Christ said. Let me inform you of something. The word in 2,000 years plus has not changed. The church better be doing it exactly the way the Bible says to, or it's not the church. Watered down Christianity preaches a message that does not convict. Oh, it's emotionally inspiring. Oh, you feel good when you leave. But not one person has been convicted of sin. Not one person has been convicted that they need to work on their life continually. Work out your own salvation with what? Joy and everything's wonderful and good. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You don't do that in one of these watered down New Age churches. No matter how fun it is to be a part of it. Sugar coating does nothing for nobody. They walk away comfortable that they're lukewarm. Comfortable that they're lost. Feel good when there's nothing to feel good about. So droves of people accept Jesus Christ under this smooth, good, inclusive doctrine. We include all the sinners. And we make sure that this color gets their way or this nationality gets to bring their doctrine in or their beliefs and the women get to do this and everybody feels equal. That ain't the way the Lord Jesus Christ made his church. Made it his way. And he put people in certain positions in his church. And he expects honor when you come in here. Not a party. Not a sipping of your tea. We're in the Lord's church. Why, as he would say today, as he said, and I said, why do you come in my house dishonoring my courts, trampling my courts for? We better be here for him. The message of God's word is to, is to convict of sin, to strengthen and talk about the judgment to come. You must be transformed before you can be committed and you can't be committed outside the truth of the gospel. That's why the majority of the churches are going the way they're going. Everyone else 
in the Christian world proclaiming that the gate of entry to the Lord is wide. But that ain't what Jesus said. Jesus said, man, the gate is narrow. It's, and it's a straight path. And few there be that find it. But most of our churches are acting like the gate is so wide. Believe what you want. Come whenever you want. Do what you want. Live how you want. Oh, God's grace and love is so good you're going to go to heaven anyway. And that is completely outside the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's those that remain faithful to the end. It's those that fight for the gospel, that contend for every word of it, that barely make it into heaven. If the righteous scarcely are saved, where's all this other hogwash end up? Not in heaven. Are you really seeking Jesus like Jesus, like Zachar, like Zacharias did, or are you more like those uh, Gentiles and Jews in the first century, where when you see this, this is foolishness to you? This is a stumbling block to you because it interferes with the way you really want to live right here out of your heart. That was their problem. They didn't want to change to please God. They wanted to believe and live and do. what they, Many don't want to hear the, tree, the, the message of Christianity. I understand that. But God have mercy. I won't want to be a part of a church just because it's popular. Just because it was big, because it's fancy, because it's fun, that don't get you to heaven. Period. But people don't want to be a part of the church because of the Bible way, because that commitment just seems too hard. Well, it is hard. Anything worth having is hard. Amen? Anything takes commitment, takes drive. And it's not easy. Anything that's easy that you grab a hold of has a commitment that ain't much worth having. Ain't too strong at all. Uh, Lynn and Laverne, they've been married for a few years, you know. I wonder if either one of those attitudes was, well, as long as it remains easy and there's no stress, there's no fighting, there's no friction, there's no money problems, then we'll stay together and to be happy. Is that the way your marriage has been, Lynn and Laverne? That's the reason now you see why marriages end up the way they do today. It's supposed to be fun. You're supposed to travel everywhere and do all of this and have all this exciting life and this and that. And then you come to find out it ain't like that. We'll find out how strong your commitment is uh, when the rubber hits the road. Kobe, let me ask you a question. You've played a few sports and you've been very successful. Was that because of a lackluster commitment to the sport in which you played? Did you just go in and shoot three or four foul shots a night and say, whoo, I've done my job and you was okay? No. Well, what about lifting weights? Did you go in and take a 10-pound barbell and do this and think, man, I've reached my potential? Is that, is that the commitment you had to that? What about the, okay, tra he, 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 he coaches and trains every athlete in every sport at the college. So, do, you, do they come in with their coffee and their donut or their breakfast sandwich and sit on the bench and work out and do their leg lifts while they're listening to music and just having a good time? Do they do that while they're there? Why, why not? And I'm not mean to put Kobe on the spot. I know he's going to have the right answer here. Do you make it as easy as you can so that they come back the next workout session? No. The very opposite. If you're going to get something, the max potential out of somebody, you push them. You make them strive. You make them earn. Why do we think it's any different in the Lord's work? In the Lord's house. And in our commitment to Him. Yes, Mom asked me, how to what degree do you think the Lord tempts us? Well, I knew what she meant. Of course, the Lord doesn't tempt us. God can't tempt us. He won't tempt us. He allows temptations and problems to happen to strengthen our commitment to him. And at that, many fail. You get out of something what you put in it. If you're giving the Lord one hour a week, hey, that's what you're going to get out of it. Ain't you glad he don't have that same lackluster commitment towards us? I think I'll give them oxygen for an hour and then I've got to hit the road. I think I'll make sure their heart beats another time here for an hour and two or three minutes and I've got something else to do. Ain't you glad God ain't to you the way we are to him? Transformation comes before commitment. 
work comes with commitment. And if you're committed to anything with a greater desire and strength than you are to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've chosen them or that over him. And there's no walking with the Lord without commitment. I could go on with that one thing for another hour. Anything worth having, you got to work for. And in the Lord Jesus Christ and his church means it's a continual work on this. A continual transformation of this. A continuing renewing of this over and over, day after day after day. And he can't get tired of it. Law, if I was going to get tired of preaching and get tired of the word and the church with the way the devil sent people in this door the last 20 years to upset me and to get me sideways, I'd have been gone 20 years ago. But I'm not in this necessarily for anybody else but him. And when I'm in it for him, I'm going to do it the right way and for the right reason. And that's to see souls saved. That's to see strength, Christians strengthened and to open people's eyes to see that we don't need church the way of the world. The world needs the church. And we can't bring it to them until we ourselves are in the right spot in our lives. Do you understand that? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, the first verse of our invitation hymn. If you are outside Jesus Christ today, if you've got wish you wash in lukewarm, if your commitment ain't to the Lord, understand this day you leave here lost unless you seek Jesus now. And if you're lost, if you're a sinner, you must humble yourself to admit I'm lost and I need to repent. I'll confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and be immersed to have my sins washed away. If you have done that and you've fallen away and got a little weak, today's the day of recommitment to him. And that starts with transformation with this. If you've got a decision, don't put it off. Come right now. We'll stand and sing verse 1. <laughs>